So, Michael, welcome to the Feel Better, Live More podcast. Thank you. It's uh, an absolute honor to sit here with you and to be on this podcast because um, feel good is what life is about. It is. Well, look, um, as you well know, swim run is something that has probably changed my life more than anything in you know, the current year. So we're in 2019. We're currently at the end of November. I've come out to Malta to do my uh, second swim run event in the last four weeks. I've come out with my son again. And it's really something that has changed me on many levels. And I'd love to explore that with you. Um, so you are the race director. Is that right? Is that your official title? I'm one of the race directors. Uh, Mats and I, we started Artula as... Um as the race is called in 2006. And we didn't know that at that time that that would be the start of um, a whole movement called Swim Run. For us, it was a very specific race that we wanted to put on. Yep. And we wanted that race to get world renowned. But then um, things sort of evolved. In the beginning, people called us idiots. And now... Uh, Maybe they do behind our backs. <laughs> yeah. Well, I doubt it. And uh, as we were just talking about before we put the mics on, the amount of people who have come out to Malta for this final event of the year is quite incredible, really, isn't it? Yeah, we have more than, I think we have uh, close to 640 people who are racing this weekend. And it was not something that we expected um, when we put the race on to have that many. We thought maybe 300, 350 would be a nice number. This is just uh, fantastic for an inaugural event. But I'm really curious, you said that Swim Run has changed your life. In, in which way? You know, I grew up um, in the north of England. And I, I've done a lot of thinking about this. And my parents were Indian immigrants to the UK. And so they came over, they're trying to work hard and give their family, so me and my brother, a better life than they perceived they may, may have in, the, in India. And a lot of my childhood was spent, you know, it was at school, but, you know, at, at, in the summer holidays, for example, we never went and really did things in nature. My parents had never left India before, before they came to the UK. So we went to cities around Europe. They wanted to see Milan and Barcelona and, of course. and Paris yeah. And, yeah. and Stockholm and, you know, yeah. totally understandably. Uh, but I didn't realize until the last few years that I really didn't have that exposure to nature growing up that I'm now craving. Yeah. And I think Swim Run has come into my life at the right time, yeah. right? Turned 40 a couple of years ago, uh, really looking to reconnect with nature, want to do something um, with friends, with community, uh, become very good friends with the guys at Vivo Barefoot because yeah. I've been wearing barefoot shoes for maybe seven years now. Okay, uh, And they've really changed the way I walk, things yeah. like my back pain, all kinds of things. And so... There was a really nice um, confluence of events that led me to Swim Run. And the listeners of this podcast will know because I, I, I interviewed Ross Edgley straight right. after I finished the, the Vivo Barefoot Swim Run uh, back in June in Bantham. That's right. Which is the very first event I'd ever done. Yeah. And, you know, four days before that, I remember phoning the race director there and saying, look, I, I think I'm going to come down, but I'm not going to do the events. I've, I've still not managed to ever swim in open water in my life. Um, I'm not sure I can actually do that. And they persuaded me. They said, hey, Ronga, look, if you want to do something like Swim Run, this is the best environment to start. We've got safety boats everywhere. Don't worry. Yeah. I went. I won't go through the whole experience again for people who've heard it before. But, you know, I was scared. I panicked during the first swim because I'd never done this before. Uh, somehow managed to get through, did the next run, swim, run, swim, run. And I finished it and I felt like a million dollars. I felt and reborn. Like completely reborn. Yeah. I felt euphoric. Um, and it wasn't just that I'd achieved something and challenged myself. It was more than that. You know, it was a real deep connection with nature. It was the fact that I did it in a team yeah. with somebody else. Though there, there was just so many factors. And I remember I only came down to Devon for the weekend. So when I went home, all I could think about was when can I do this again? Cool. Uh, I got in touch with one of my buddies who, again, one of my best friends who lives 
200 miles away from me. Yeah. And he's also interested. We said, well, why don't we do a few events together? Fantastic. And that's our plan for 2020 yeah. is to meet up and do swim run events together. That's fantastic. So I think there's quite a few things there. Yeah. Um, and I, I hear and I feel everything you say because I, I understand the emotions because I feel the emotions too when I do it. I've been doing this for, well, it's our 15th year next year that we do swim run. And for me, it's, um, it's exactly that, that special connection that you have with nature. And I feel that the most when I'm in the water. And I also feel it when I'm in difficult trail, when you're sort of navigating and you have to go on instinct instead of thinking. Yeah. And it's amazing when, and I, I sometimes, or not sometimes, when I go into the, into the water, I feel how my body becomes part of something bigger because we're all electric pulses and we're all beating hearts. And for me, the beating hearts, we all sort of connect in the vibrations in the ocean. And every being in the water is connected through these electrical pulses. We don't feel them, but we all are. Yeah. And when I think of that, when I go in the water, it's like, it's the most profound thing is going in the water and just feeling that, that connection with nature. Yeah, I think you just so beautifully put, I think, how I feel when I'm in the water. Uh, yes, I enjoy the running part of it, but for me, it's about being in the water. And I guess for someone who, what are we now? We're ending November. Yeah. I went in the water for the first time end of June. So July, was September, October, November, five months ago. Yeah, you're, you're that, still a non you, I'm a novice, right? You haven't come out yet. I'm, yeah, <laughs> so I'm still five months in. And yeah. this summer, after that swim run event, when I actually went down to Devon again, and every day I went and swam in the ocean, I felt alive. This wasn't just swimming. Uh, this wasn't just uh, working out, doing physical activity because it's good for me. Yeah. Uh, this was something much bigger, much yeah. deeper. Yeah. I felt, you know, I felt deeply connected. You'd yeah. see wildlife. You, I don't know, you just feel alive. Uh, it feel makes me so happy to, f I mean, I get goosebumps when you tell this story because that's what it's about. And, and you know, four weeks ago, we were in Cannes yeah. and I met you for the first time. Yeah. And again, I came out with my, my nine-year-old boy. We did the experience event together, yeah. which on, you know, of course, is a great bonding experience for a father to do with their child, yeah. number one. Number two, um, it was tough. Yeah, yeah The conditions absolutely. were tough. It was tough. You know, I remember particularly on the Sunday that swimming from one island to the next, you can only breathe one way because if you... If you breathe the other way, you would get a mouthful of water each time. Yeah. And I finished it and I, I, I thought to myself, wrong in five months ago, you couldn't even get in the water. And no, you would have been terrified. And now you've swum yeah. in some pretty challenging conditions. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and on a personal level, it feels great. Yeah. But me and my son have spoken about this over the last few weeks. Yeah. And um, it's just incredible because I think, you know, as a father, I take, like all parents, I take the the role modeling and the education that I can give my children very, very seriously. Arguably, it's the most important thing I think I do. Yeah, I agree. And even this morning, I was just texting some of my buddies saying, look, yeah, I've taken them out of school today to come and do another swim run event. But for me, this is education, right? Yeah, absolutely. Teamwork. Yeah. Uh, respect for the people around you, respect for the environment, yeah. uh, connection with nature. Yeah. How do you overcome adversity? Yeah. Because... On yeah, these yeah. races, there will be adversity at some Always. point. Yeah. And that's the point, right? Yeah. And so for me, I guess my, you've, you've heard uh, my experience in the last few months of how this has changed my life. Mm. And I've already got four or five races in the diary for next year. That's and, fantastic. You know, and it's, yeah. I hope I managed to make them all. Um, but what experiences have you heard from other people since you started putting this on, giving this event to the world? You know, what have other people reported back to you? That's a very good question. Um, I, th I think what the, if I just think of what the general feeling is, is that the connection with nature and the challenge with nature, uh, where you realize, I mean, most people in society, I think, believes that we can conquer nature. 
because we are that type of people. Uh, and the lifestyles that most people lead have no connection with nature. And then when you're exposed to being out in nature where you realize that you can't do anything, the only thing you can do is adapt. And it creates a bit of a paradigm shift because when you realize that it doesn't matter who you are, it doesn't matter what job you have, it doesn't matter how much money you have, the only thing that matters is you, your partner, and how you work together and how you adapt to the conditions around you. It's if it's stormy, if it's wet, if it's raining, if it's slippery. I mean, the, the combination of running and swimming, running and swimming in nature where you constantly have to adapt to what's around you. And it creates a completely new tool set where you have to be um, more open to what's going on around. You have to be more sensory, more, you have to feel more. And I think that is the, the big difference that swim run has done for a lot of people, where it's not about chasing time because time is less important than adapting to what's around us. Yeah. In many ways, what you're saying is it teaches you to constantly be able to adapt, to overcome adversity, to be resilient. And actually, these are skills that we all need to actually survive and thrive in our everyday lives. Yes, they should be. Uh, but in our everyday lives, I think we've gotten so detached from what reality is that we, uh, and I don't mean this in a, in, a, um, in a superior way or whatever, it's just that the way that we lead our lives is that it's, it, it's, it revolves so much about, uh, around money and the, the chase for money so that we can live a certain way that we want to. And we sort of put our instinctual and let's call it animal skills aside and we don't develop them. And I think this sport or the activity of swim run, and not, I don't mean just racing, just the activity of swim run, exposes you to nature and it also makes you, you have to be uh, adapting to your partner as well. Yeah. So you have to feel and, and communicate how you feel and you have to show each other weakness and strength and you have to feed each other to help each other forward. Yeah. And that is something that I hope that we can share as a community with people around us and like you with your, with your son and, and with other children just to show that there is another way. Yeah. That together, I think we're so much stronger if we are willing to support each other, respect each other, and and work as a flock of animals instead of yeah. uh, trying to become superior all the time. Yeah, I mean, it's a lovely way of looking at it. We are animals. Yeah, we are. I mean, it's we have to admit it. You know, we there's are. no way around it. We're animals, and yeah. we become detached from what it means to live as a tribe in harmony with the people around us. Um, you know, there's so many things going on in the world, which means we've all become, or many of us have become very me focused and yes. I focused. Uh, social media lends itself to um, that sort of narcissistic trait that may exist in many of us. It really comes to the, to the forefront because of social media platforms. And again, I'm not here to criticize social media. I think social media can be used in a oh, great it's, way. It's a fantastic tool exactly. to spread fantastic messages. Absolutely. You guys on your social media accounts, you, you, you share lovely pictures and inspiring information about the events and the sports. I, I like to do similar things on my own channels. Um, but, and again, it's not just social media. It's the way we are living these detached lives. And, and I agree, you know, by taking part in an event like this, particularly the fact that you have to do it with a partner, that I think is very unique about it. And I wonder where that has come from because, you know, I haven't done triathlons, okay? I think for many people, triathlons are a great way of them spending time and activity, uh, you know, spending time and their free time. But for me, 
I'm not at the moment. It doesn't appeal, right? And that's maybe because I've got the swim run bug, and I see the next few years that's going to be something I'm going to do a lot of. Hmm. But one thing I have felt in the three swim run events that I've done so far is a lack of competition. Now, let me just explain that because, of course, some people are there competing, trying to win. Yeah, yeah. But there seems to be a real like collective community feel like people are supporting each other you go around and when you've finished a difficult swim even people who are technically racing against you the smiles we're chatting you know you're giving each other encouragements and there seems to be a very um just a very unique atmosphere to yeah. swim run that i ha i haven't done a triathlon so i don't know if it's the same there but for me, this feels what I'm at in my life at the moment, and this is what I want more of. Well, I think it comes, or not think, I know what it comes from, because uh, Mats and I, we raced adventure racing together uh, since 95. Uh, yeah. We started racing together. And we built a career around adventure racing. And in adventure racing, you race as a team. And it's a, it, it's a team that has to have both genders. So you're completely dependent on each other. And we raced in teams of five, and we had a race in teams of four. So when we decided that we were going to do the original Latia back in 2006, we, for us, it was natural that you would do it as a team of two because uh, you share an experience that is uh, not only your time or your position or whatever in the race, but you share an emotional experience and you go through things together. And that is so much stronger and it it's something that is rooted deep inside of us in a different way than uh, in an individual race where you're you know the only thing you can share with a friend or with somebody who asks you how your race was it was difficult it was uh, easy i went fast i was slow uh, but nobody will th understand the emotions that you actually went through yeah unless you're in a team and so that was uh, the original idea. And also, of course, from the safety standpoint, because we were sending out people into, a, into nature without uh, much of a safety net. Of course, I mean, we have race marshals and we have safety boats and whatever. But you are dependent on yourselves and you are interdependent. And I think that is the big difference. And then when you compare, and again, I don't want to camp compare either but the difference between triathlon for example and swim run is that in triathlon you know the a swim distance is set a run distance is set and it's usually uh, on a flat tarmac road and a bike's uh, distance is set so in your training you know how fast you swim you know how fast you run and you know how fast you bike and you can constantly monitor during a race if you are keeping up to your time or not in a swim run race you don't know because you don't know what the terrain looks like a run that's uh two kilometers you might think oh i can do that i usually run at a 4 or 30 pace so i'll be done in nine minutes but it might take you 20 minutes yeah because you don't know what the terrain is and we don't change things on the course we let it be we let nature be we have to adapt and the same thing with a swim you know, if the waves are big or if there's lots of current or whatever, you again, you have to adapt. So you can never control the factors of time and performance. The only way and the only thing you can control in swim run is how you and I as a partner, how we function together. Yeah, It's the only thing we can control. And if we control that and we do that well, then we will be fast or faster or whatever. So I think it's completely opposites of the endurance spectrum, triathlon and yeah. swim run. And then when you then get back to um, what this does to us is that, you know, we, we have to learn to be dependent on somebody else and trust yeah. that person to show everything you have. As a doctor listening to that, I've got to tell you, it, it, it just spoke to me at my core because one of the biggest problems, one of the biggest health problems as well as social problems in society is loneliness. Yes. Loneliness is, is reaching epidemic levels all over the world. Yes. It is not just in the elderly. 
In the UK, men between the age of 30 and 45 are some of the loneliest in society, wow. which is incredibly uh, powerful when you think about it. And it's all to do with the stress response and you know how we're wired. Uh, we evolved in a very different environment from the environment in which we live and stay. We've, we've evolved depending on other people. Yes. You have to in have other tribe. people. In, in a, a tribe. tribe. Yeah. yeah. Whereas now we can live by ourselves. Yes. We can work by ourselves. We can feel that we're connected by going on our computers in the evening. Yeah. Um, we don't even have to go to the shops and buy things anymore. We can buy uh, on an online, online app yeah. and it can be delivered to us. Yeah. And so what it means to be human, actually many of us can live in a way that is the direct opposite of what it has always felt like to be human yeah. and still survive yeah they may not be thriving but they're surviving yeah and i guess what you're saying and maybe this is why i feel such a deep connection to this sport is because on so many levels it ticks a box yet it's it's fun to go and push yourself physically yeah yeah it's fun to push yourself mentally yeah but it's also fun that you connect with other people in real life yeah and then also you know we're living in a time where people are concerned about the environment Right, with good reason. Yeah. Climate change is a massive, oh, yeah. you know, arguably the biggest issue. And then I can't help but think that once you get in touch with nature, I mean, this is exactly what's happened with me. Mm. Once you get in touch with nature, you can't help but be concerned about the environment. But if you live in urban, disconnected lives, and nature is this thing that you read about or you see on TV or in a film, it's easy to think it like us and them, that it's different, that we're, we can be separate from nature. So I actually feel that swim run and, and other events which connect us to nature in many ways are an absolutely vital ingredient to get people connected to the problem of climate change. Yes, absolutely. Uh, because you see it. It's yeah. it's apparent. I mean, you go in the water and you see pieces of plastic and you understand that this doesn't work. And you realize that fish have plastic inside of them because they eat it because it's colorful or whatever. But it's it's really interesting what you say with this connectedness too because, I mean, there, it's proven, you as a doctor, you know, that if you go out into the forest and you go for a walk for half an hour or 45 minutes or whatever, it greatly reduces your cortisol levels. It helps you, uh, it, it, it helps grow your frontal lobe in your brain and also uh, your um, uh, hippocampus or whatever you call it. Hippocampus, yeah. Hippocampus. And these are vital for reducing stress inside yourself. So uh, when we look at the base of swim runners that we have, they're mostly your urban people who live quite active or how would I say uh, could be stressful lives. I think that's also a reason why people are getting so switched on to swim run is because you go into a complete analog world and you you don't have to deal with social media. I mean, you, you're disconnected. Yeah. And during that time, you're also in nature and this goes back to our ancestry and i think it helps reduce cortisol levels and yeah. everything so that when you come home when you get out of the water you've shared together with another person uh you feel that a day or a week or a month has basically washed off you yeah and that is one of our ultimate goals is and that's the reason why we've uh, change from just having a World Series races on the Sundays to sprints and experience races so that more people have access to the sport so it's easier to get in so that you can get out yeah. and just get away. I mean, that's interesting to me because you have these three levels, the World Series level, the is it called the World Series level? Yes. World Series level, sprint, and experience. And I was interested as to how that came about because – you know, for many people, even the sprint, which is the mid-distance, will be too intimidating yes. to actually give this a go. And I'm always thinking about some of the listeners to this podcast who may be thinking, okay, 
I, I love what you guys have been talking about. It sounds great, but how do I do that? You know, I, I, I am disconnected from nature. I've never swum in the ocean before. You know, I don't know if I can do it. What would you say to them if they're listening to it and they've, they've had something that has sparked something inside them? What would you say to them if they're feeling a bit nervous or scared? I think life is taking one more step than you have done before. And, and I really mean it. It's literally taking one more step. If you, if you haven't run for years or if you haven't swam or whatever, just start walking. Go out into nature and walk. And then after a while, you can maybe run one minute and walk two minutes. And then after a while, you run two minutes and walk one minute. And then you run three minutes and you walk uh, and you walk two minutes. It's just about getting things moving. Yeah. And if you're out in nature, I think you will feel that you will feel less stressed out. And then when it comes to the water, I mean, most people know how to, how to swim. You don't have to be able to crawl or, I mean, get in the water and start swimming. And if you if you don't want to go into the ocean, start in in the pool. Yeah. And then after you feel comfortable moving in the water, or you feel comfortable in the water, go into a lake, or into a river, or then nothing has to go from zero to a World Series race, which is quite you know extreme, I would say. I mean, everything is about taking one more step, yeah. and daring to take a step outside the box because we can all do it. I'm convinced everybody can do it. If your son who is nine, uh, I'm not saying, I'm not making, uh, reducing your the, the ability of your son, but I'm saying that the trust, because the waves in Cannes, they were hard. They, they were big and there was way, and there was, and the trust between you and you went out and you started in that, type of condition, which, which is fantastic. But I think anybody can do it. I think that, uh, anybody can do it. Yeah, Michael, that's a great point because I think back to that. And now I'm, it's amazing how quickly your circle of comfort expands. It's, Always. Right? Literally four weeks ago, I know my son wanted to do it. He saw me do it in Bantham. And I'm thinking, you know what? When I was nine, I never had access to anything like this. No. Right? No, I'd never been in the ocean, never done any of this stuff. I thought, what an amazing experience would be. And I, you know, I was thinking, I, you know, I've I've always liked taking on challenges. Now I would never do anything to put him in danger. But there was slight anxiety, I'm of sure, course. because I was thinking, okay, so he hasn't swum much in the ocean. We're about to go into these very choppy and wavy yeah. conditions. But the fact that we did it. And we overcame it. Yeah. I mean, he's buzzing. I'm buzzing. Yeah, and of I'm, course. I'd like to think that this is going to stand him in good stead for the rest of his life. Absolutely. Gives me a lot of confidence as a man, as a father, right? Because let's think about this. We are living disconnected lives, right? We work behind computers. Um, we often are driven or take transport to work. Uh, as I said, we can get our shopping delivered to our house. Actually, it feels pretty good on a on a really deep human level that I can look after my boy. That I was out in, the, in an ocean and it was wavy. And, you know, this sounds a bit old-fashioned, right? But it's a good feeling to know that actually when there is adversity there, I can look after my family. I think that's one side of it. And the other side of it is, I think, uh, really the importance of what is manhood. And to me... It's one side doing what you did, but the other side is also being emotionally aware of your son's emotions because you're responsible for his experience and his emotions. And it's not about pushing that to a level where it creates fear no. or, or um, adversity. It's about building those positive cornerstones of those emotions. And I think that is something that has been very important for Mats and I is that I mean, we never speak about anything being tough or anything being, um, you know, you have to be a certain type of a person or whatever. We, we, 
we want to lift out the emotional power that we as people have if we're willing to reach into the emotions that we have because the power we have in our emotions is so much stronger than what we have in our arms or in our lungs or in our legs. And if we can tap into that and share that with a partner, I mean, it's so much stronger. And that's one of the reasons why we also stand at the finish line and we hug every person, the first and the last, because we want to share. You have given us your trust to go out and do the race. We want to share your experience, and we do that on a physical and emotional level. And it's, it's so much more important than saying, oh, I'm tough or I'm muscles or whatever. Yeah. Yeah, it's, you know, hearing you speak, it's, it's really very powerful, Michael, because I knew that I love swim run and I knew it has done something to me. And I try to, you know, I try to rationalize it with the logical part of my yeah. brain, right? Even though actually we're at our strongest when we, we go with instincts. It's all instincts and, and emotions. Yeah. But the way you're articulating it from your side, it makes me realize why it's, why it's been like a, a shot in my arm, almost like a drug of yeah. that, you know, it's changed me. Yeah. It, it has fundamentally changed who I am as a person. Oh, that's um, fantastic. I feel it's changed many of my relationships. I view the world differently. Um, I view myself differently. And, you know, again, thinking back to that person who's listening to this at home or out on their weekly walk, and I think, it sounds good, but I'm not sure that's for me. We are all capable of more than so we think more. we are. Yeah, yeah. And the thing that you get about nature that people forget is that we can go further in nature because, uh, and this has been shown in many studies, um, we can run further, we can swim further because there's something about being in nature, our perception of it is very different from when we're doing 25 meter lengths in the pool or on the treadmill in the gym. You know, uh, there, uh, there's no... There's no comparison. There's no comparison because you have to feel and connect. And so you forget, oh, how many laps did I do or whatever? Because you are, you're adapting to what's going yeah. on around you and you're yeah. moving with the flow in nature. And do that's you, exactly it. Do you think there's something about swim run that meant it could only have come about in Sweden? Is there something about it? Is there something about Swedish personality? Is it clearly something to do with the Swedish terrain? I mean, why don't you say, where has Swim Run come from? How did you guys come up with this idea of this new event that is now spreading fast all over the world? Well, originally, as I said, Mats and I, we were racing adventure racing, and that was our, our sports career, and it was part of our business at the time. And we started in 95 and we uh, had a race, we had a team until 2008. Mats raced uh, all the way until 2008. I stopped racing in 2003, I think, but then I worked a lot with, you know, all the, um, uh, all the media and financing and all of that. Um, and at the time in 2005, I had my car in a car shop and, the, and we had just done a big TV show in Sweden. And uh, I went to pick up my car, and the guy said, uh, "You're the guy in the in who's doing this adventure racing stuff." And I said, "Yes, I am." And he said, "Oh, but I'd like to talk to you. I have some friends who did this bet. It would be great if you could do something commercial out of it." And I wasn't really interested, but just because he had fixed my car, I said, yeah, "Well, tell me what is it?" And he said, "Well." Uh, on the island of Uta, which is uh, in the Stockholm archipelago, and outside of Stockholm, there's 30,000 islands. Uh, they, the four guys were having after-hour drinks, and they started challenging or talking about what they had done in the archipelago by boat or kayak or skating or sailing or whatever. And then two of them, who were brothers, they challenged the other two and said, Oh, we will run and swim to the island of Sandham, which is uh, 75 kilometers further away. This, uh, this is whilst they were drunk. Yes. So they were drinking. And they challenged them. And they, a bit of bravado yes. between friends. And it was between a challenge. Between men. Yeah. Between men. <laughs> yeah. And so they challenged each other um, 
to run and swim to the island of Sundam. And the challenge was that the last team, because they had to do it in pairs, that arrived to the island of Sundam would pay a full night in the bar and the hotel and everything like that. And to on the way there, there are four restaurants on other islands, and they had to pass those restaurants to know that the others were safe, one, but also so that the first team that came there would order what the others would have to drink and pay for. So it was basically a long drinking game. And a couple of weeks later, they set off, and it took them, you know, 30-odd 30, 30 hours. And they did it in 2003, and then they did it in 2004. And they tried to get more people to come along in 2004, but nobody wanted to. <laughs> and so I heard about this. It was in October 2005. And I was just, I was like, wow, is that even possible? And he said, yeah. And I had spent quite a bit of time in the archipelago. And I was like, wow, that sounds fantastic. And I said, I'd, I'd love to meet these guys. And then I took my car and I called Mats. Uh, because we had a business together and we were racing together. And I said, Mats, how do you, how, what do you think about this? And he was like, oh, sounds crazy. And I said, yeah, it does. Let's see them and see what we can do. So we met them and uh, we talked about it and they said, well, we took us this amount of time. And we said, well, the only way that we can do this in a commercial way is that we can manage it within daylight hours. Otherwise, it becomes too dangerous. And we started playing around with time of the year because in the summer there's too many boats in the archipelago, so it's dangerous. And we said, okay, it has to be at the end of the summer when there are no more boats, but before the water gets too cold. So we decided that we would do it uh, the first weekend in September. And uh, we then said, well, well, what should we call it? And Mats said, well, let's call it Ötila because that's what we're doing. And Ötila means island to island in Swedish. So that's exactly what it means. Yeah, that's what it means. And the ö uh, with this o with two dots is an island. And so it's island to island. Wow. And, and then we said, okay, that sounds great. That's what we're doing. And then we designed the logo with the runner and the swimmer. Yeah. And uh, that was it. And then we said, okay, we have to test it. So in June 2006, uh, we went to the island of Sandown. And we got in them. We said we had to start in Sandam and finish at Uta because that's we can have a good party there. And we got in the water and we started running and swimming, running and swimming down towards uh, Uta. And then after three quarters of the way in the late afternoon, we said, okay, this is fine. People can manage. <laughs> and then uh, we started calling friends because it was before Facebook and everything like that. Uh, we started calling friends that we knew in the endurance world and said, oh, we're going to do this race. Come race uh, for us. So the first year we had nine teams and two teams finished. And the second year we uh, coerced four teams the night before the race in the bar to come and start the race so that we could have more teams um, the second year than we had the first year. So the second year we had 12 or 13 teams. And we said, you have to start and then you can drop out after the first swim. And again, the second year we had two teams yeah. that finished. And now this year, I think there's more than 700 races around the world. There's, we in our races, we have participants from over 50 nations. So it's, it's a sport that's spreading like wildfire. So that's, that's sort of the, the origin of it. And um, it's fantastic. I mean, realizing that this idea, and we said in 2012, we realized that, okay, this is really taking off. It's not just one event. People want to do more of this. And so we started creating more events. Yeah. And, and for us, it was sort of our legacy from adventure racing. We wanted to do something after adventure racing that could, you know, grow. And we realized in 2012, oh, it is going to be out there and something we can push and create a sport out of. Yeah. And now, I mean, it's a sport. And even if we disappear, if Atea disappears, the sport of swim run will continue, which is fantastic. Uh, yeah, it's it's really cool. It's incredible to hear that. And it just shows you that, you know, just a couple of guys out in a bar, having a few drinks, chewing the fat together, ends up with this idea that becomes this this global sport. And, and going back to your question, is it uh, a sport of our time? I think... Everything in life is about 
seeing an opportunity and doing something with it and then being persistent because yeah. if you feel that this is something that is right you keep working at it i mean it, it's not like it's been easy all the time I and mean, we've done a lot of a lot of soul searching and a lot of battling and a lot of you know it's 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 been a journey but it's a journey where we're taking steps forward all the time and it shows that there is plenty of things that happen in life and we just have to see the opportunities and make something good out of it and yes i think it it came perfectly in timing because before when we were racing and adventure racing we spent heaps of money creating tv productions and then finding tv channels that could send it and so on yeah and with the rise of social media and the digital media it's been a very different story trying to spread the the story of swim run and it's easy with images and 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 video and we reach a lot more people in a much easier way so yes it is the sport of our time yeah it really is and i think it reminds me of something I, I wrote when I was writing my last book, The Stress Solution. Um, I think the words were something like, many things we do in the modern world and technology drive us inwards. Nature is expansive and forces us outwards. And yes. <laughs> as you were describing Swim Run just then, wow. I never really thought about it as, it is, it is almost the antidote to the problems, or one of the antidotes, I should say, to many of the problems it's we are the facing. Only antidote. It's the only antidote. <laughs> That's how I feel. Yeah, yeah. But I'm just, uh, it is, it is, there's so many things that by default will improve your life. And I really want, um, you know, I'd, I'd love the listeners of this podcast to think about this and think about, I wonder if swim run is for me. I wonder if actually, um, I should give that a go and look it up and maybe get in touch with a friend. Or what you can also do, and like I did, you can get teamed up with an experienced racer. Yes. And this is exactly what I did. So I've, you know, I was, I wasn't actually tied to them, uh, even though you can do that, but I went out with an experienced swimmer. Yeah. So it just gives you that sort of, um, that ease, that, that comfort when, if things make you a bit scared you know there's someone around you who's kind of been here before yeah and i really think that is one of the most unique things about swim run that it's yes it's all in nature but more importantly you do it with someone else yeah i think it's incredibly powerful um it's probably what is pulling me to it more than anything is that i do it with someone yeah um and you know i had the books to come out a couple of days ago you know i hurt my wrist a few weeks ago i didn't think i'd be able to and i tell you honestly like many of us, my workload is through the roof at the moment. And I could yeah. have, I could think of a thousand reasons not to come. Yeah. But all I needed was one damn good reason yeah. to book the flight oh, and get on the plane. Fantastic. Thank you. And it was the event. It was the fact that it's about experiences. It's that my son wants to come. It's the end of November. This is our last chance for really to get in the ocean together yeah. before Next the European year. winter. Yeah. Let's just do it. Yeah. Work will be there when I get back. Yeah. Just go and do this. Yeah. And um, you won't have heard this. I'll send this to you afterwards. I, I had a conversation with James Wallman um, a few months ago back on the podcast. And he wrote this brilliant book on how we should spend our time. What is the most productive use of our time as a human oh, wow. being? Yeah. And he's got these seven rules. Yeah. And if anyone's listening says they haven't heard that, do go back and listen to that because there is a lot of, um, there's a lot of wisdom and what he has to say. But one of the things he advises is get outside and get offline yeah, and create an adventure. Do things where you create stories, yeah. right? Where things go wrong and you have to overcome them. And then that evening you're talking about it. He says, that's how you make really meaningful experiences. And when I, this is really funny thinking about it now. When I spoke to James on the podcast, I'd never done swim run. Yeah. Right. But now, had I had that conversation with him now, I would be saying, look, swim run pretty much ticks all of these boxes. Huh. You know, I can't remember all seven of those, yeah, yeah. Uh, what the tools were, but I'm going to go back and have a look. And I would not be surprised if swim run ticks most of those boxes. Mm. And so 
I think there is something incredibly powerful about this event right now uh, in the 21st century. One thing I really like about the events is that there's a real focus on the environments. So the, the events are done in harmony with the local environments. Uh, you know, plastic is not allowed, all this kind of stuff. I really, I really like that. Um, is that something that you had feedback to put in or was it always a natural part of how one should do these events? Well, I think when you have um, spent a lot of time in nature and not in the sort of uh, city park, but I'm, I mean in, in bigger nature, you realize what the world looks like with, with garbage and what it looks like without garbage. Because when you've been to places where there is no garbage, you really see the garbage that we have around us. And what, yes, we are creating events in places where people travel to. And uh, what we want to do to offset that is to try to um, bring awareness to the problems that we have around us and try to do something good about it. And we, we feel very strongly that we want to, to create a sm as small of an impact as possible being an event. So that we, we always say that what we want to leave behind is footsteps and memories. We don't want to leave any garbage. We don't want to create extra garbage. We do create some garbage. But we say, okay, we don't do any course marking with any plastic. Everything is with cellulose, with paper. And that came about actually from one of the first RTOs where we had plastic taping that we, like most events do, uh, to show the way. And we went through a, a paddock and the farmers called us and said, you can't do that because if the horses or the cows start eating the plastic taping, they'll die. And we had no idea. And I was like, Oh, my God, that would be the worst thing that I could ever do. So we right away started sourcing. And this is, you know, back in 2007, I think, we started sourcing uh, a byproduct from the from the forestry industry, which is this uh, cellulosa paper um, ribbons that we use so that one, if an animal eats it, it's it's not bad because we go through nature. They're for sure wild animals. And two, if for some reason something blows down, it, it is biodegradable. Um, so that was the start of that. And then Mats and I said, okay, we have to really try to do as little impact as possible. And then now it's two years ago, um, we realized that we were consuming about 60,000 cups in a season. And we were, you know, it was paper cups and it was recycled. But anyway, we were producing them, transporting them, using them once, throwing them away, and then creating garbage. And we said, and we at the same time, it was an English race called Breca. They had just introduced a, a collapsible cup that they had given to their racers. And we said, oh, we have to do that. So we then right away decided, okay, we take away all our cups. So we only have cups now on the first two energy stations. And the reason for that is that um, there's too many teams or too many racers, so it, it becomes unfair. And it's a race, so it has to be fair. But beyond that, every racer has to have their own collapsible cup or whatever they have to drink um, at the energy stations. We don't provide any more cups which has greatly reduced the amount of cups. Another good part of that is too, we say also from the very beginning, from 2006 when we started, is that anybody who throws anything on the ground, any paper or any gel wrappers or whatever, if we see it, we disqualify you. There's no discussion, you're out. But the best part of it is that the racers, they tell each other, hey, you dropped something, can you pick it up? Yeah. Or somebody says, oh, you dropped it. I'll pick it up and I'll give it to you. And so the community is really managing this in a good way. Not saying that there's not garbage on some yeah. courses. 
which is unfortunate. But we also have a sweeper team at the back of the at the back of the course, and they take everything down. So at the end of the race, when the last team is finished, we know that the course is empty and that if there is any garbage that has been dropped, it's been picked up, and probably we have cleaned up more than there was before. Yeah. So that's important to us. We also have uh, this awareness campaign that we call Clean the Ocean. Yeah. And we have an activity once during the race weekend where we go out together with our racers in the local community uh, and we do a uh, search, garbage search and collect. And the purpose of that is actually to raise awareness that 80% of the garbage that we find in the ocean is thrown on land. Yeah. And if we all can do something, then maybe we can, we can get somebody else to inspire somebody to start picking something up. So now when I go out running, if I see something on the ground, I'll pick it up. Yeah. And I think if we all do this, we can do it. And I think it's fantastic with all the school children who are, you know, who have this a strike for cl for the climate yeah. on Fridays and everything. Just please go out and collect garbage during that time and yeah. not just sit down, you know. Yeah. I think it it's it's so easy to walk by a a piece of plastic but it's even easier to pick it up when yeah. you start realizing yeah and it's it, it's so fascinating how you, how you've described that because you know i think many of us will see that garbage and go it's not my garbage i didn't drop that i'm not picking it up but actually it's our world it's our garbage it's if we don't pick it up it's going to still be affecting us in the same way as it's going to affect everyone else and I think that's the key here, right? So a lot of people these days... And uh, sorry, just to butt in, but please. if somebody sees you, yeah, just walk by, stop and pick something up off the ground, it will probably start creating questions in their head. Yeah. Lead and, by example. And that's what we have to do. And for our children, and for, I, I get mean, it. we have to. I'm so on board with that. It's not about telling people off necessarily or telling them what they should be doing. That doesn't work no. long term. It doesn't work across the population. It doesn't work as a doctor with a patient telling someone what to do. There has to be some sort of other incentive, some sort of emotional connection before we actually go and change our behavior. Yeah. And I agree, you know, there's something very powerful about seeing someone go, oh, well, they just picked that up and it wasn't them dropping it. And then it almost forces you, a bit like a mirror, to question yourself and go, hey, well, you know, I don't really do that. Maybe I can do that next time. Yeah. And, it, and it really is powerful. And then there's a wider conversation here that when we talk about the environment, it does appear, and I think Russell Brand did a, um, did a video on this recently about Lewis Hamilton, because Lewis Hamilton is talking a lot more about the environment. And he's getting a lot of criticism because he's in Formula One. And I don't want to go into all the ins and outs of that. Yeah, yeah. But one of the things he said in that video was really powerful. He said, if the price of entry into the debate on climate change is personal perfection, we've got a big problem. Yeah, for right? sure. And it, maybe he articulated it slightly differently, but I thought that was so powerful. Yeah. We are all imperfect. Yeah. Pretty much all of us are doing something that is leaving a footprint on the environment. Yeah, Does that yeah. mean we can't talk about it? Does that mean we can't raise awareness? Does that mean if we ever take a flight, then that excludes us from talking about climate change? No. I actually would argue... Um, that events like Swim Run do so much for the environment. Yes, there's a carbon footprint on people traveling there. Okay, you're not denying that. I'm not denying that. But the awareness you get from connecting with nature, um, connecting with other people, understanding nature. And I could tell you from someone who didn't grow up with nature, that is like a light bulb moment, Yeah. right? You are suddenly connected uh, to the world in a way that often you're not when you live uh, away from nature. Yeah. And so I think that's very powerful. I think what you also said about that these events that you and your uh, and Matt's put on, you have competitors um, from over 50 different countries. And I think that's another point which I think is worthy of discussion. A lot of the problems in the world, I think, come from this idea that we're separate. Yes, separate from nature, but separate from each other. These barriers, um, you know, there's obviously these polarizing debates on Brexit at the moment. But I fundamentally, at my core, believe that 
we are all connected. We're all the same. You know, you, when you're out in the ocean and you're a bit out of breath, right? It doesn't matter if you're black, white, or brown. It doesn't matter if you come from Sweden or, or the UK. Or woman or man, whatever. woman, yeah. you have got the same problems yeah. or the same challenges to overcome, yeah. right? We're all the same. Yeah. And actually, once we start realizing that, that I think the whole conversation around the climate, the environment, connection, Gender equality. Gen I think it becomes a lot easier. Yeah. These things are only problems because we see ourselves as separate. Yeah. Michael, given where this all started back in 2005, when you became aware of this crazy idea of swimming and running and swimming and running over and over again, now we're at the end of 2019. Could you have ever imagined 14 years ago that you would be here today. You'd be here in Malta. And, you know, so many hundreds of people are coming out to compete and participate in these events. That's the first point. And the second point is, given how quickly and rapidly this seems to be growing now, what are your hopes for Swim Run in the future? Well, to answer the first question, I mean, there's... There is no way that we thought that it would be this huge movement that's that's happening at the at the moment. I mean, for us, we had one ambition that was to create a a world famous race, which Ertia has become. So that we managed. Uh, what we didn't realize, and took us some time to realize, that it was the beginning of the root of something that we could feed and make something bigger out of and when we then started feeding it we had an ambition of growing it but i i mean there is no way that you can imagine just like stepping through all these thresholds and yeah. dimensions and you realize that the world just expands it's like a big bang you know sort yeah. of thing um, so no, there is no way you could imagine it. And I have no idea what it will be like in another 15 years, but can you dream? Well, what I would like is, and we talk about this internally and, and what I would, would like is that Ertia and then swim run. But I mean, if we start and if we do it with with our events, and then maybe the sport will become uh, the spearhead into society where uh, at least we can be a vehicle for change because we are connecting with a lot of people um, and we are creating platforms. And thanks to this talk, we're broadening that platform as well. And we can use it to create change. And the change, not something we want to force onto people, but that people realize that this is something that is a way, a way forward. There's many ways forward, but it could be a way forward. And if we can be successful in creating change through our events, then I think that would be the ultimate goal. For us, the ultimate goal is not it's not monetary. It's using what we have to create something bigger. Yeah. I mean, I think you've already left a legacy here in a big way. Um, I think I, I read recently that the peak age for people competing in triathlons is, you know, in early to mid forties, something like that, which sort of makes sense to me that at that stage in people's lives, Often they've had kids, they've sort of been weighed down by mortgages and all kinds of pressures. And then they're searching for something more. Is this what life is? Just mm. going to work, driving there, coming back, waiting for the weekends yeah. over and over again. Do you know what are the peak ages of people? Or what are, what are the common ages of people who come and compete in a swim run? Well, it's changing. Uh, originally, it was, you know, people in their early 40s, you know, late 30s, early 40s. And in the beginning, you know, the sport grew with them, so aged with them. And now we're in, in a generation shift. 
So we see a lot of younger people coming into the sport, which I think is fantastic yeah. because um, they are bringing something new to the table. And they're also, and I see this, uh, I, I speak a lot about it because in Sweden we have a big problem with it, that we live, uh, we live horizontally, we live in, in generations and we don't mix vertically yeah. and learn from each other in generations. But in swim run, or in our races, we have people that are, well, we have your son. Yeah. And we have people that are uh, in their late 60s, early 70s. And if we can learn from each other and be a community together, then that's fantastic. And I, I, I want us to be inspiration for people to go out and experience swim run and experience nature, they don't necessarily need to come and participate in mm. race because racing is, it's one type of a mentality. But if we can get people to go out and, and experience swim run, then I think we have achieved something very special. Yeah, for sure. And, and I would just add there for people who are thinking about this, it's almost like, if you have not really connected that much in nature so far and or you would like to connect more with nature, I'd really encourage people to, to look up a swim run event because you're doing it in a very safe, controlled environment. Yeah. And what that can do, as it has done with me, is it gives you a taste, you really experience all the benefits of it, and then you then away from the events, you want to access nature more. Yeah. Right. So it's not just about the event. It's almost just like a gateway in yeah. for many people. And some people will be listening and go, well, I always access nature. That's fine. Yeah. Great. If you already access nature, maybe this is another way of seeing nature and, and, and experiencing nature in a different way. Yeah. But for someone who lives in an urban setting and struggles to be active, and I know I have many listeners like that, don't let this be off-putting let it be inspiring allow look at it and go look at an experience event and look at the distances and go you know what? i could do much more in that race environment anyway when i'm in nature have you got a friend who you can do this with you can be accountable yeah. to each other and train um i honestly believe it will change people's lives and then, you know it's it's actually when you say that you know, from that standpoint too i want to point out that you know in a seven and a half kilometer race where that's the total distance, a run section or a land section, because it doesn't even have to be running, you can walk it, uh, is no more than uh, how, a kilometer and a half. Yeah. And a swim section is no more than 400 meters. Yeah. So, it, I mean, it, and you can breaststroke that or float it or whatever. So those seven and a half kilometers, uh, you um, consume them quite quickly. Instead of if you go out and you say, oh, I'm going to go for a run, in town for seven and a yeah. half kilometers. I mean, you don't want to do it. Yeah, Michael, I was so glad you brought that point up because that is the key. You're not doing these long, prolonged distances in one discipline. You may run for 1K or walk it for 1K yeah, and then swim for 200 meters yeah, and then run for half a K. Yeah. And then, you know, it's broken up and you're yeah. using different muscles each time. So it's actually very, very achievable. And if you want to walk or do breaststroke or just lie on your back on your wetsuit and get your breath back, you can do that. Yeah. One of the funnest things, again, for people who aren't familiar with this, is that I love the fact that whatever you start the race in, you finish in. Yeah. Right? So it, it cuts out all this kind of transition and changeover. It feels very mentally freeing. You just rock up at the start line with whatever you've got on. Yeah. And you will finish like that. Yeah. You run in your wetsuit and you swim in your shoes. Yeah. It is it is so much fun. Yeah. It really is so oh, much great. fun. Yeah. Um, final question really but is... Just to fill into that too, I think also that by it being so accessible in that way, you can really take away all the all the financial problems or the financial not problems but the financial uh, setback that you would have with with for example buying a bike or yeah. renting a bike or traveling with a bike and all of this stuff it's easy like you say it's so easy to get out hey i i just i remember when the first event i did i didn't know much about it I just knew I was swimming and running. I knew I needed a wetsuit mm. and 
Again, I'm not recommending people do this, but the morning off the events was when I literally got this wetsuit out of its wrapper and thought, oh, does this fit me? This feels pretty tight. I'm not sure if this, you know, yeah. I'm not saying that's the right, that's the best, it's not the optimum way to do it. But it's the way that most people do it the first time. Yeah, but it was the way <laughs> I did it. But then I, I remember getting on the bus yeah. to the start line and I, I felt like I was like, you know, Forrest Gump or something, just rocking up to the local pool because I was in this wetsuit that I wasn't sure that fit me. I had my trainers on, I had my goggles, that was it. And then I saw people with pool boys and yeah. all kinds of other paraphernalia and initially I started to go, oh, should I have more? Then I thought, actually wrong. And it's quite freeing. Yes. Not worrying about that stuff. You've just got the the basics. Just yeah. get out there and do it. Yeah. Yes, now I go and do it with a pool boy. Now I understand how much harder I made it for myself by not having a pool boy. Yeah. But you don't need that much to get going. No. And I think that's inspirational. Yeah. I wanted to talk about children for a second because a lot of the themes we've spoken about is, yes, what a swimmer can do for us individually but also potentially what it can do for society and bringing people together and the environment. And of course, all those things are great for adults. But if we're going to really change the world, right, wouldn't it be amazing if kids and children had access to all these feelings and experiences rather than waiting for when people are 40, 42, 45? And I'm slightly biased asking that question because as you well know, I brought my nine-year-old son to the event four or five weeks ago. He's here with me again today. We're competing tomorrow morning. I say competing, I should say we are participating tomorrow morning because that's what it's about for us. Yeah. We're there to have fun, get yeah. out in nature, see our friends, see the yeah. community. Yeah. Um, but have you been asked this question? Is there more interest in children participating in events like this. Of course, there are logistical issues as well than if you could have a load of kids coming, I get that. But is it something you guys have thought about or is it something you will think about, do you think? Because I really think that you are on something, that you and your partner really have created something that is much more than physical activity. It is so much more. It deals with our physical health, our mental health, but also deeply our emotional health. Yeah, And planetary health yeah and therefore for me as a father you know i want kids to have access to this yeah and and we we feel the same i mean we're fathers uh, ourselves and you know we have families and and i think the most important responsibility that we have as a parent is to create uh, self-confidence and belief in yourself and expose you to making wise decisions when you are young. And the reason why we haven't gone fully into the kids' races and so on is that we feel that it's really important that the child makes the decision that they want to compete or want to participate, but that they also know what they're getting into because we don't want to scare them. We don't want them to have a bad experience. And that's why when parents say that they want, to, we don't say that you can come and race with your kids, but when parents can contact us and say, can I bring my, can I do this with my son or daughter or, or, uh, with a child and we say yes if the child wants to not if you want to yeah. because there's so many parents that are pushing their kids to yeah. do things that the kids may not want to do yeah. so our first question is that we want the children to want to do it yeah. and i try to talk to most of the children uh, to make sure that they also realize that, hey, if I don't think this is fun, then I should stop. Yeah, It's okay that it's challenging, but if you feel scared or you don't think it's fun, stop. stop. Yeah, And say no, because that's a word we have such a hard time to use yeah. and we need to use it more. No is a really important uh, word for children to learn. Yeah, But it has to come 
from them and not from the parent. Yeah. Do you understand what I'm saying? 100%. And, and that's the reason why we're, we're a little reticent because we don't want to create something. I, I want the child to, I want to be part of this and yeah. I want to try it. And then you can start moving yeah. that way. So I would rather move slowly down that path than to hurry it up and hit a wall. Yeah. I, I think such, such important points. And, you know, from my perspective, it has always been led by my son. He has always been saying, I want to do this. Yeah. It's never come from me. He witnessed me do that event where I got scared. He was there. Yeah. And I'd like to think he saw daddy get scared, but overcome adversity yeah. and show him and my daughter that, hey, look, you can also overcome obstacles that you don't yeah. think you're able to overcome. So he's always driven that, that he wants to do it. That's probably the reason I'm here this weekend is because yeah. he kept asking me, daddy, daddy, we're going to go, we're yeah. doing Malta, we're doing Malta. Yeah. Um, so I think that's a really important point. I also want to raise that when I first uh, got invited to Cannes by a mutual friend of ours, I text him and say, hey, look, a kid's allowed to do this. Yeah. And I think our mutual friend contacted you and forwarded me the text when I didn't have your details. I said, yeah, Michael says he can do it as long as he finishes with a smile on his face. Yeah. And I loved it. I absolutely loved it. And as you guys well know, that's exactly what he finished with. Yeah, yeah. And I'm, I'm almost certain that tomorrow morning he will also, if we do finish, which I'm sure there's no reason why we won't finish, will also finish with a smile yeah. on his face. Um, Michael... This podcast is called Feel Better, Live More. When we feel better in ourselves, we get more out of life. I think these events that you put on absolutely uh, demonstrate that more than anything. People, I'm sure, go away from these weekends, different people. They go change. They're feeling better. It's going to impact uh, their work, their relationships, the way they feel about themselves and the people around them. I always love to leave the listeners with some simple, actionable tips that they can think about applying into their own life immediately to improve the way that they feel. Now, you have lived a checkered life. You've had so many different experiences and a whole variety of different disciplines. I wonder if you have any closing words of wisdom for people listening right now. Yeah, I think it's uh, take one more step than you're doing today. Step outside the box. It just takes one step and the box gets bigger and you see something new and you realize something new and you have a new experience. So one step out of the box. Everybody can do it. Every single person, no matter if you're the best athlete in the world or if you're somebody who's never been in the forest or whatever your situation is in life, we take one more step out of the box. We expand our world so much. And say hello to somebody. Brilliant. It's two fabulous tips. Michael, thank you for what you and your partners are doing uh, for the thank sport, uh, for the world, for helping improving people's lives. If people want to get hold of you or they want to find out more, where should they go? Well, I think the best way to find us is uh, on Otillo uh, Swim Run. So basically, you, you go to the internet and you look up Otillo Race. Yeah. And uh, you find us that way. Absolutely. And guys, thank I will, you very much. I will put links to everything we spoke about. I'll put links to their website, their social media channels in the show notes page uh, for this episode of the podcast, which will be drchastity.com forward slash swim run. Michael, thank you very much. I have no doubt we will do more of these conversations at some point in the very near future. Thanks for your time today. Thank you very much. That was fantastic. Thanks, buddy. Give us a big hug. Thank you.